Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm Jonathan Kay. And yes, it's not your imagination. My voice is different. At first, I thought maybe this would be something that I wouldn't mention because the difference was subtle. But then I listened to the edit on this week's episode and I was like, okay, that is obvious and I've got to say something. So the thing is, I got Omicron a few weeks ago. Uh, My whole family got it. It tore through our house and we're all fine. But in my case, it left me with a little souvenir, which is this raspy voice. But the show must go on, right? My guest today is American documentary filmmaker Rob Montz. You might remember him from 2019 when we had him on the podcast to talk about his hilarious but also unsettling profiles of free speech crises on elite American campuses. And he's back with a new short film about Harvard University's attempted cancellation of one of its most famous black academics economist and education expert Roland Fryer. In fact, you may have read Rob Montz's recent article about his project, which appeared on the Quillette website under the title, Why Did Harvard University Go After One of Its Best Black Professors?, in which he explains how Fryer's heterodox ideas about race and schooling have made him unpopular among Harvard colleagues who prefer that everyone sing from the same progressive songbook when it comes to controversial issues about identity. And by way of introduction, here's a two-minute audio excerpt from Mons's new documentary. The voices you'll hear are, in order, Harvard professor Roland Fryer and filmmaker Rob Mons. It wasn't until I got involved in education I heard about the cardiac test. You'd walk around a school and you, they would say, we have a new program, after-school program. I would say, oh, that's great. Does it work? And they would say, yeah. And I said, well, how do you know it works? You can feel it in your heart. <laughs> Roland's work brings him here, to the Harlem Children's Zone. It's a revolution, taking in poor black kids and within three years getting them to catch up to and even exceed their white peers at richer schools. You know, we really got to think about this gap here because there's like a white black gap going on. I'm not sure why you guys can actually achieve. He starts piecing together a five-part formula for the zone's success, and he finds that a central piece is aggressive human capital management. Economists speak for the practice of firing tons of teachers. He asked the teachers, what do you think you need to educate these kids? And we got answers like, well, all we need is smarter kids. I said, all you need is a new job. The Zone's formula is simply operationalized common sense. Revolutionizing schools won't require a revolution. They needed extra time. If you're behind, you either got to spend more time or ask the white kids to please take Thursday and Friday off. Small tutoring groups, they used data to drive instruction. They had high expectations and they took no excuses for failure. The highlight of Roland's youth were summers spent with his grandmother a Florida grade school teacher. And she notices what he notices about this formula. I talked to my grandmother about every other day. She lives in Daytona Beach, Florida, very close to here. And I told her the five things. And we're family now, I'll just tell you what she told me. She said, baby, they pay you for that shit. (laughs) I know what's obvious. But if it's so obvious, why we're not doing it? So, Rob, thanks for being on the Quillette podcast. I'm a big fan of your videos. You've done Brown. You've done Yale. Your latest is about Harvard, and in particular, Harvard professor Roland Fryer. Like, what is it with you and the Ivy League? Like, where did the Ivy League hurt you? (laughs) Well, I'm just trying to systematically make it impossible for any of my offspring to successfully attend the Ivy League. So we've got three of them down. Maybe we got to find a scandal at UPenn and Cornell next. And just over the course of the next five to 10 years, I can just systematically 
Render them radioactive <laughs> in their college admissions process. I tell everybody my kids are going to study air conditioning repair in China. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh I guess it's not they hurt me. I think I still I think I still am an unrepentant romantic when it comes to what these institutions are supposed to do. I do think that they serve some sacred purpose, right? Like this idea of knowledge generation and dispersal is extraordinarily important for the future of American society. And so I guess that means I take it very seriously when there is, you know, catastrophic institutional failure in pursuit of that mission. I've seen enough of your videos. They do have a certain arc where you build up the institution at first. You have all these really grandiose shots of the buildings and the citadel of learning. You kind of pay these places the backhanded compliment of saying, if you look at the aesthetics and the propaganda of these places, it really is supposed to be the smartest people learning from the best teachers in the ultimate atmosphere that's supposed to be conducive to truth finding. Do you honestly believe these places can get back to that ideal? No, I think I probably fall down more on the uh, University of Austin model of the creation of new institutions from scratch. There's too much. Well, remind, remind listeners what this University of Austin business is. That's that brand new school That's that's got all, all the name brand luminaries of what used to be referred to as the intellectual dark web behind it basically create a brand new university from scratch that's founded upon the idea not of ideological indoctrination, but rigorous adherence to the principles of free speech, open intellectual inquiry. So that's starting from brand new as opposed to reforming the institutions from within. Part of it also is when you're thinking about what's creatively inspiring, what's creatively inspiring is to go after the big fish, right? I'm sure there are free speech academic scandals at Richmond Community College but like, what's the fun in investigating that, right? Like, I want to go after the alphas. Like, I want to show that you can expose the most powerful, the most moneyed institutions in American life. Like, there's just something like kind of naturally romantic and exciting about that. So I'm sure that's part of it, too. I mean, there's plenty of other academic scandals and people getting canceled at lesser institutions, but it's not nearly as narratively compelling. Let's talk a little bit about Roland Fryer Jr. How did you first hear of his story? Glenn Lowry podcast. Okay. So in the summer of 2020, Glenn and John McWhorter on their regular, at the time was Blogging Head show, which I'd imagine, if you listen to the Quillette podcast, I would imagine you're familiar with Glenn Lowry. And we've, we've had Glenn on our podcast. Yeah, of yeah. course. And the, and the next level genius that he is. He and John discussed a piece that was in Real Clear Politics written by Stuart Taylor, who appears in this documentary that we made. That was the first long form, serious, rigorous investigation into what, what happened to this dude's career. Glenn had taken particular interest in it because Roland was a mentee of his. And Roland, to a certain extent, represented like, he was like Glenn Lowry 2.0. Yeah. Like same, a very similar background, very similar elite cognitive ability, also got to Harvard at a young age, but I mean, as opposed to Glenn, didn't crack under the pressure and have his career stalled. Glenn is now at Brown. Glenn's at Brown. And obviously Glenn's a genius, so his career is done just fine. But Roland got to the highest level and then he leveled up in ways that I think even Glenn would admit that he had not done when he was there. And Roland, once he gets to Harvard University doesn't just become the youngest tenured black professor in the history of the university. He goes on to do like world conquering applied economics that wins him the Clark Medal. Best economist under 40, I think. Yeah, right? under 40 in the entire world, in the entire world. And in, in, in classic Glenn way, like he fears no man. And he just went over the course of this conversation with John, they talked about this piece. And Glenn just more than hints at the idea that something gangster went down here. The second I heard that, that's definitely one of those like, whether or not you think the muse is some like disembodied sixth dimensional creature that comes into your body, or if the muse is just automatic neurochemical responses to something you find stimulating in your environment, that's what happened in that moment. And it just took a little bit of time. I, at the time, did not have my own channel. And I had tried to pitch this idea to 
some channels and people were scared of it. So tell me what you mean by channel. So I, I'm the CEO of Good Kid Productions. We are an independent production house for most of my career up until last year. We had been making videos for other YouTube channels. A Reason, for instance. Reason Magazine, We the Internet, Capital Research Center, Pacific Legal Foundation, a lot of kind of libertarian nonprofits in the Washington, D.C. area, which is where I lived up until last year. And so we were, we were a for-hire, for-profit company. And the success of some of the work that we've done on those channels got us the opportunity to start our own channel. And that's what hosts this Roland Fire documentary. We'd had difficulty finding someone who'd be willing to both finance the project and also run with the project, given the <laughs> given the, it's 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 a it's an anti me too story as a political and cultural phenomenon, not anti me too in terms of sexual harassment. And but once we got the opportunity to, to basically run whatever we wanted, this is the first thing that I thought of. I was like, this this was something that deserved a documentary. It had been overlooked by legacy media institutions, if not overlooked, it had actively been misrepresented by the likes of the New York Times. This is exactly what we want to do and exactly what we want to make. There's kind of a weird subcurrent here, which is that you were listening to John McWhorter and, and Glenn Lowry, two well-known black intellectuals, talking about this guy, Fryer, and the way he was treated by other black intellectuals at Harvard. Here, you and I are two white guys talking about this. Ten years ago, I don't think this would be a big deal. Now it's like, obviously, we're not staying in our lane. If I stayed in my lane, I wouldn't do any podcast. Yeah. You say, well, it goes against the grain of me, too. It also goes against the grain of this idea of talking about race as a white on black or black on white phenomenon. In terms of the Harvard story, you're talking about different political camps within the black intellectual community at Harvard. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is it weird that I'm the guy who's doing that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a little weird. <laughs> well, there's no way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, on one hand, it is a little weird that it's just like, it's just the chubby white guy that's decided that- You're not that chubby. And I, I sorry, I don't want you to defend your weirdness. I, just, I was just pointing it out because part of my role as a podcaster is pointing out what everybody's thinking. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, let me also say though, on the same hand, that implied rule that somehow we're not allowed to talk about it. Fuck that rule. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that. I'm sorry. I don't know if you're allowed to swear, but like- No, you're totally allowed. That rule's garbage. I refuse to acknowledge that. We don't have to answer to any institutional authorities. We don't have to ask for anybody's permission. These rules are made of nothing other than like social media intimidation, and we refuse to buckle. If I find something interesting, we're going to talk about it. And if there's a black guy listening to this and he wants to do like a video documentary about superannuated bar mitzvah boys like us. That's fine. If he wants to debunk the Rob Mons as culture vulture, <laughs> I, I, I'd watch the shit out of that. Yeah. I, and I think also, but the one other thing is the way at least that we try to build this documentary is to let the people that are in it do as much speaking for themselves as possible. Inevitably, because I'm the narrator, there's going to be points where I come in and I editorialize. But a, a lot of the draft process was had my creative team telling me, you need to clamp down on that. Right. Not because they're worried what media matters <laughs> thinks about us, but because it makes for worse material if you're constantly stepping on the people that are at the center of the drama. Tell me about this dynamic going on at Harvard that Fryer walked into. He himself is a remarkable, as I put it in the, the essay for you guys, the, he's like a movie script of a man born into complete economic depravity. He's abandoned by his mother. He does not meet his mother until he's in his 20s. He's raised by an alcoholic dad. And it kind of dabbles in small time crime, but then somehow works his way from that circumstance of birth to becoming this superstar economist at Harvard University. Yeah, while he's there, what he bumps into are the unwritten codes <laughs> of being a prominent black intellectual at Harvard University. There's lots of things that are informally rendered verboten right? Or not even verboten, just certain topics you are not supposed to be investigating, period. Doesn't even matter what your answers are. You're just not supposed to be 
devoting substantial Harvard prestige and resources to investigating these questions. You imply that there's a class aspect here. Yes, we do. You talk about Larry Bobo and you talk about the dean of the department. Claudine Gay, 100%. He comes from the wrong side of the tracks. They, it sounds like, come from maybe more privileged backgrounds. They got, well, let's put a fine point on it to a certain extent. (laughs) To a certain extent, they got to where they are by play acting the suffering that Roland had actually experienced. Let, let's walk that back a little bit. Do you know that it was play acting? Bobo more than gay, but gay mostly, they came from very similar backgrounds to me, which again, are products of privilege. Fancy private schools, nice universities, a nice, easy academic life. That's not to say that they've never experienced, I'm sure that they have, but in terms of large structural barriers to their professional advancement, they did not have to suffer through those. Roland absolutely did. He had to overcome substantial disadvantages to get to where he got to. And as a result of it, he didn't, as far as I can tell, harbor any insecurities about breaking from standard political orthodoxy for the black intelligentsia at Harvard University. But I think your thing about the class is very interesting. And we get into this a little bit in the doc, but the stuff that Roland ultimately got in trouble for related to uh, loose sex-related talk in the office. That kind of way of speaking and communicating is completely standard issue. It was locker room talk. In working class communities. Not black communities, not white communities, but working class communities. I guess I was surprised that the stuff they had on him was really not that bad. Jokes that if I heard in a staff meeting, I kind of like, ooh, you're not supposed to say that. But it wasn't Like, for instance, they found that he had never actually sexually propositioned anyone, for instance. I think you can make the reasonable case that he crossed boundaries, particularly when it comes to an academic environment in which there are enormous power asymmetries between the all-star tenured economics professor who raised tens of millions of dollars to finance the lab that everybody else works in. And particularly when it comes to like graduate students. And this is an education lab. Right. It's an ed lab. There, it's particularly the, 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 the graduate students that were working underneath him where whether or not he writes them a letter of recommendation is life or death in terms of their ability to get a tenure track position later on in their career. That under those circumstances, it's worth having certain boundaries on what you're allowed to say when it comes to human sexuality. That could be true while at the same time. The punishment that was engineered for him was absolutely disproportionate. Well, the dean wanted to, the dean wanted to revoke his tenure, right? Now you said something in your essay, which is quite incredible. Is it true that no Harvard professor has ever had his or her tenure revoked in the history in what, like a century or something? Yeah, I I looked. So the way I formulated it was such that I might be proven wrong on this, but we looked into this and we looked back as far as it could go. And I actually saw an interview with Harvey Mansfield. I think it was related to some unrelated sexual harassment case of a different college professor. And Mansfield, who's been there, (laughs) who's been there since dirt, he's like been a tenured professor there since the 1960s. He said he had no recollection of any Harvard professor ever having their tenure revoked. Like a retired professor might have emeritus status stripped, which of course is, that's a big deal and would be a gigantic dishonor. But in terms of an active professor having tenure revoked, that's never happened. So, and, and I'm sure Claudine Gay knows that when she puts in the request for that to happen. She's trying to get away with something like epic. And now a message from one of our sponsors, BetterHelp Online Therapy. So let me ask you whether any of this sounds familiar. Headaches, teeth grinding, stomach pain, doom scrolling on your phone, insomnia, compulsive overeating or undereating. Of course, we all have bad habits and aches and pains we'd like to shake, but sometimes they're a sign that you might need to talk to someone about what's going on in your life. I try to take care of my own stress with reading, board gaming, and sports, but I know from experience that self-care can only do so much, and sometimes you need to talk to a professional, which is what BetterHelp is about. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist and you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Plus, it's much more affordable than in-person therapy. So give BetterHelp a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Quillette podcast listeners get 10% off their first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash Quillette. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Quillette. 
And now back to our Quillette podcast. So let's talk a little bit about the substance of what Roland Fryer advocates. The field of American education policy is littered with these false hopes. Someone will come forward and say, I have this amazing new model. Among both conservatives and progressives, there, there have been a lot of grand proclamations about new approaches that, that don't pan out. In your video and in your article, you speak of what Roland Fryer did, especially in Harlem, as truly groundbreaking and that the results really did live up to the hype. Could you explain a little bit about what he did and, and why you're so sure that this is the real deal? What he sets out to do is find a vaccine for education. That's how he formulates it, which is the chronic malignancy in American life is the black-white achievement gap. It's been there for a long time and it hasn't closed despite decades and decades of effort. The politically correct formula for how to solve this chronic malignancy, which is smaller class sizes, more credentialed teachers, and higher per pupil spending, have all definitively failed to solve this problem. I think I saw somewhere that Washington, D.C. has one of the highest per pupil public school spending indexes, maybe in North America. And it has like third world math and English <laughs> achievement rate. But they spend a lot on teachers. Exactly. So he's like, I don't have time for that BS. What he's basically trying to do is find a formula that can be extracted from a successful educational model and then be injected into every other school system in the country that can finally cure this chronic malignancy. And that's how he stumbles upon the Harlem Children's Zone, the details of which well covered territory, but it's is remarkable in that it's able to take poor kids from really desperate circumstances and within a matter of just a couple of years get them to catch up to and even exceed their white peers at richer schools, particularly in math. But it involves firing a lot of people. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> he basically spends, I think it's a couple of years, and he goes in and does detailed in-person analysis of what exactly they do that other people don't do, right? And one of the things he finds, one of like the five essential ingredients is aggressive human capital management. Wow, that's quite the euphemism. Right, which is firing tons and tons of teachers. I think Harlem Children's Zone over its first year fired 50% of its teachers, extremely aggressive about ejecting mediocrities, which again, runs against a lot of the politically correct formulas about how Every public school teacher is is Jesus and Gandhi wrapped into one. And then he's given the opportunity to port it into the 20 lowest performing public schools in the Houston public school system. And he, he, he's, he's taking the bunt cake recipe and he's going to try to replicate it in Houston. And the first thing that he does is I think he fires over half of the teachers and 100 percent of the principals. That's the, one of the first things that he does. I can see why this guy's so popular. Right, exactly. And I think after two years, English achievement had plateaued, but he's able to get substantial improvements in math achievement. And again, another thing that we talk about in this piece is one of the essential pieces of the Harlem Children's Zone miraculous recipe is a culture of extreme expectations, regardless of people's childhood circumstances, right? where, as Roland puts it in a publicly available lecture, he's Harlem Children's Zone tells kids from hard backgrounds, sorry for you, but now we're just going to teach you the Pythagorean theorem. So they don't take any excuses. So you're obviously a big Roland Fryer fan. Why didn't he appear in this video that you made? My impression is that he was worried about additional retribution from Harvard University. And given how the power players at that school conducted themselves the first time around, that frankly feels like a completely justifiable worry to me. In your video, you talked about him being canceled. Is it fair to say he's been canceled? Like, he's still a professor at Harvard. He still has tenure. Like, hey, I, I love knocking cancel culture, but the guy's a teacher at Harvard. Like, how canceled can he be? A... He's a teacher there, despite the best efforts of the Harvard establishment. But they failed. That means we won, right? They tried to permanently sever him and unperson him as best as they could. And because he just happens to be all world resilient, he's still there. That's one part of it. The second part of it is, though, is 
here's the best way to articulate the true tragedy here, which is a Clark Medal winning MacArthur genius who had a multi million dollar policy laboratory that was creating breakthrough, cutting edge, applied economic research in issues like policing and crime and school reform is now demoted to teaching a single undergraduate class per semester. Is he going to come back though? Because we've seen the pattern here, right? Like remember Louis CK couldn't get a cup of coffee in, in any comedy club. Now he's packing a house. Is, is there a certain pattern to these things? Like, well, we couldn't cancel you. We're going to humiliate you. And then five years from now, it's going to be in the fifth paragraph of his Wikipedia entry, but otherwise it's going to be just the way it was before. My team and I were talking about like, what is success for the Rolling Fire documentary, right? Hey, it's, it's had an incredible reception. You're a white savior. <laughs> I, I swooped in. It, I'm saying, you know, as someone who really cares about this guy, insofar as you can care someone you don't really know, is there some way that it could substantively affect his career? You know, what, what, how would that, what would that even look like? Is it... Is it like, is it a success if when people Google his name, our documentary shows up before the propagandistic New York Times piece about him being suspended shows up in their Google search results? Is that technically possible? And if that is possible and we achieve it, does that make a difference? Does that actually alter the narrative and alter the story about this guy? I, I have to say, I don't really know. Well, ideally, it'd be the Quillette article, then your video, then the New York Times. <laughs> article, this podcast, then, yeah, I get, get it correct. Uh, Rob, thanks so much for being on the podcast, and thanks for your great article in Quillette. You want to give us a tip about what you're working on next? Yeah, first of all, I should say, if people want to watch the documentary, if they haven't seen it yet, they can either see it embedded in the piece that, that I wrote for Quillette, or they can just go to whocanceledroland.com, whocanceledroland.com. It's a custom URL we've set up. People can watch it there. We've got a couple documentaries related to this thing called the coronavirus. Please tell me this isn't what canceled ivermectin. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, one of them is... Uh, one of them is related to to masks, masking policy, and people that are still masking their children now. I wear a mask sometimes if I'm in a crowd, but there's some real mask fanatics here in Canada, and I get the sense five years from now they're still going to be in their mask. For me, I don't really, they can do whatever they want, but don't lie to me that it's not a big deal to be putting a five-year-old in a mask for two years. I agree on that. No, no, thank you. Cool. Well, congratulations to the success on the Roland Fryer Project. And I'm sure we'll have many occasions to have you on again. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. 